Um, call the meeting to order. Angela, please call the roll. Michael Brown. Here. Peter Dillingham. Here. Randy Gilbert. Here. Estella Hernandez. Here. Edward Hillary. Here. Thank you. Okay, and this time let's rise and have the Pledge of Allegiance and then the salute to the Oklahoma flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I salute the flag of the state of Oklahoma. It symbols of peace unite all people. You may be seated. I gotta say, I don't know why the uh, Oklahoma, the pledge is good. Oh, do we do a moment of silence? Please stand. It's not on the thing. <laughs> well, yeah, it is. I didn't read it. Okay, please bow for a moment of silence. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, we will hold uh, Superintendent Hoffmeister's comments until she arrives. She thinks she'll be about 45 minutes late. And so I'll go ahead. Uh, the first thing I want to say is um, I, I want to tell you all I'm very sorry about what happened with board member Hanning. Uh, I'll take full responsibility of it. Um, I'd like to say, you know, I didn't mean to do it and I certainly didn't, but it totally slipped our minds at the agency to let her know about the change of meetings and I'm heart, heartfelt sorry that it happened. Um, I've talked to her on the phone and then I hope you all received the email yesterday. Um, but it was a big oversight on our part and we'll take the blame and we'll try to do better. Angela uh, is sending out calendar invites now and uh, we'll try to rectify that situation. Uh, she's unable to attend today, uh, which um, I'm very sad about that too because she came last week here. So there was a big misunderstanding because if we had had it, it would have been in Stillwater. So there, there's a, it was just a big under, misunderstanding and at the agency we're very sad it happened. So I just wanted to apologize to you all as well because uh, we, we're very proud of our board. We like what you do. We like the service that you give for nothing more than just maybe travel expenses. And so I know there's a lot of time involved and in taking away from your days where you live. So I just want to express my uh, sincere apology to you all as well. So, okay. So I guess uh, one thing we've been doing the last three weeks I've been showing up at the Capitol with Mike Brown. <laughs> it's really weird. Every time I'm there, he's there. No, well, well, um, it's scary. Yeah. It is scary. It, it's kind of scary, but I just thought he was interested in what we were doing. I mean, you know. <laughs> but anyway, we um, you we told you earlier in the year, back in May and June, about the ARPA request, about 8.8 .8 million that we got for nursing. So that's in the bag and. Um, there's going through all the paperwork and everything, and uh, but then there was a second uh, tranche of money that we applied for. And at the agency, we applied for a truck, dri truck driver training grant to put some regional sites for truck driver training. And those sites are gonna be at Northeast Tech, Tulsa Tech, Kiamichi Tech, and Caddo, Kiowa. And uh, we got 6.2 million uh, to put, and it's mainly to buy trucks. Uh, Caddo, Kiowa needs a classroom. And one of the other tech centers needs an actual track at their school where you can, you know, you don't want to put them out on the highway first thing, where they can learn to drive. So we got 6.2 for that. And then about three weeks ago, uh, Sky McNeil, who lobbies uh, with OKACTE uh, and lobbies for us and myself were asked to sit down with Senator Pugh and Representative Rhonda Baker. And through that, they basically told us, we've got money for broadband, we need to, this is how I know Mr. Hillary so well because his uh, company works so well at putting broadband in rural Oklahoma. He, they do a great job. But we need somebody to do the training. And so we want you to apply for ARPA grants to do the training. So with a really fast turnaround, we asked for $5 million. And when I say fast, we had 11 tech centers that are interested in it. It's mainly for equipment. Um, as you know, um, broadband can be buried, it can be hung, or the last mile they're thinking sometimes should be um, 
uh, Wi-Fi or, or on towers. So there's a lot of different types of fiber to be laid. There's lots of different types of fiber. I'm not even going to start to tell you the equipment they need because I'll forget something. And um, But there's refractometers, there's digging equipment, there's poles to learn how to hang it, there's different types of fiber, different colors of fiber, uh, they need scopes. There's just a whole battery of equipment that our tech centers will need. So we wrote an ARPA request for uh, five million and we were awarded five million. So um, at least 11 tech centers are interested with six to eight more uh, doing the thinking about it. That's the one thing I like about our tech centers is they're flexible, they're agile, and some of them feel they can actually set up training by January of 2023. So very exciting. So all in all, we got about $20 million in our funds. 8.8 .8 to nursing, 6.2 for trucking, uh, 5 for uh, broadband. And that should add up to almost $20 million if my math's right. So that's very exciting. I do want to give kudos to Lisa, uh, our CFO. Uh, before, and you probably had to do this too, just before uh, last week's hearing where you, this thing will be heard four times by the legislature when all said and done. We're past number three, so we really feel like it's going to make the last hurdle. But before the third hearing, they sent us a 33-page, is that right? 33-page document with all of the specifics for this broadband grant. And Lisa, actually, thank you. She spent 24 hours practically getting this ready uh, so that it was timely back to the legislature where yesterday they could pass the five million. So kudos to Lisa. The truck driver training grant, um, they've been working on that since, actually since the second day I arrived back in February. So they had a great paper trail for that. So Alice um, that works now for Kaimichi who wrote the grant initially Alice Rushmore, she did the 33-page document then, but it, and I appreciate her, I do, but she had all the information from the grant application, and Lisa really grounded out in 24 hours, so kudos to our CFO, Lisa Batchelder. Okay, that's that. Um, we have promised you, you know, our, our uh, numbers in October, and these are preliminary numbers, they may change, but we're really excited about the way career tech enrollments are going. You know, career tech is hard to teach during a pandemic. It's hard to teach welding on Zoom. I don't know many mothers that let you have that torch in the living room when you're on the internet. But in fiscal year 22, we had 95,390 students learn the important leadership skills as members of our seven uh, CTSOs, our career tech student organization. Uh, that's up 20% from fiscal year 21, which was 79,356. Our total career tech enrollments for fiscal 20 year, were fiscal 22, pardon me, was 446,940 students. And that's up from 426,125 in fiscal year 21. So 20,000 more students, basically. Uh, enrollments at our tech centers was uh, 298,672 in 22, and that's up from uh, 295,000 from 21, so up about uh, almost 4,000 total enrollments. In our PK-12 programs, so this is FFA, FACS, STEM, and BIS, uh, totaled 127,875 in 22, up from 121,730 in 21. So that's uh, 6,000 more students are involved in our K-12 uh, schools. I say K-12, PK-12. I've got to get used to saying that. That's hard. Our skill centers was up 1,045, up from 893 in 21. And of course, Justin's here. So if I misspeak, Justin, correct me. But when they, during COVID, when they uh, have, they shut down the whole program for, how often were they shut down? shut down for several months about seven months we shut down the thing to remember about that when they shut down their students discharge I mean if there's we don't start them until they're within a year of discharge so when they shut us down for months we lost all of our students so hence the 800 the year before it was terribly low because of that so we're racking back up but DOC still shuts us down now because of COVID but it's a two-week shutdown now versus months 
So we, we're really excited about these numbers. Um, the companies we served in fiscal year 22 were 6,671. Those are our industry partners that we work with. And, it, and if you look at a graph of this, most of this is customized training for these companies. And that's what we feel like we'll be doing with the broadband ARPA dollars. Um, in October, you'll get the final numbers. So these are preliminary, they'll change. I hope they go up, uh, but these may change. Okay, um, in October in Stillwater, we participate a lot in the United Way Fund Drive. So October 22nd to, excuse me, 26th to November 7th, uh, we're going to uh, be part of the United Way campaign. I heard a, a talk yesterday from the Payne County United Way and their goal for the first time ever is a million dollars. And uh, we're a big partner in that. Uh, we're gonna have a live auction and a chili cook-off and a d dessert cook-off. And I'm entering. This Russell Ray is our chairman this year and uh, for the agency. And uh, yeah, I'm gonna, I'll be entering this. No favoritism. No, it'll be blind. Uh, last year we raised 23,000 and the goal was 20,000. So again, our goal is 20,000, but we're hopeful that we can beat the 23,000. Um, as if you're ever in the agency, which I hope sometime you all will come and just walk around, you'll think, see things like spelling bee champion. And you know, first I go, you were in a spelling bee. How old were you? And they go, oh no, that was United Way last year. So uh, it's a fun time for the agency and they, they really get involved. And the one guy had three spelling bee uh, little ribbons in his office. And so I thought, well, they must have done this the last three years. And no, he thought he was such a good speller. He didn't want anyone else on his team. So he got all three ribbons. So. <laughs> I won't say his name. Um, we, I don't know if you guys read the journal record, but Russell's done a good job. Um, actually, ever since I've been there, making sure we have column, a guest column in there. And I've gotten a lot of... Uh, uh, calls and, and emails about it and there's my ghostwriter right there he does a great job but in, on September 19th uh, we talked about uh, time to expand career tech programs and more and more I think lawmakers and policymakers and educators are realizing uh, the opportunities we're giving students uh, as far as training for industry specific jobs and courses and so we're providing technical training to nearly half a million students each year. And uh, more can be done to reach more students and meet the labor demands of our Oklahoma businesses. And we feel like we have, our, and I've told you our request for the um, legislature this year, and it's for tech centers, it's a $40 million ask with 10 million of it going to the industry side of it where industry training, customized training, but 30 million of it to expand programs to kind of alleviate the, um, the waiting lists that we have at, at most of our tech centers. The superintendents are in Stillwater. And yesterday I was talking to him, I said, how many of you all have waiting lists? And there were so many hands up, I go, let's go back. How many of you don't have waiting lists? And two raised their hand and they're rural, uh, rural tech centers. So it's a huge need and uh, know that it's out there. Also, we're asking for the 164 PK-12 programs that are unfunded to be funded. And um, both of those asks are sheer education of our Oklahoma kids. And so I'm hopeful that uh, um, the legislator will see fit to, to fund those programs. Um, let's see, what else? Okay. Um, we talked about broadband, it's rumbling. There were, Mike, you were there yesterday. Were there, oh, were you there yesterday? Wasn't there yesterday. No, uh, Clarence was. I was cluing in from uh, virtually. Well, real <coughs> fast, tell them about your project. We've talked about you being there for ARPA, so go ahead. Uh, well, uh, the Lawton Fort Sill community requested $20 million for the FIST, of which I've talked to you all about, Fires Innovation Science and Technology Accelerator which through the leadership of our local career tech was able to get started and ginned up as an idea to support Army Futures Command and several things going on with the modernization of our Army. But not only that, uh, education for young kids, STEM, um, makerspace, uh, and so 
through the help of actually Senator Pugh and his group mm -hmm. and in our group, most of them did uh, well. Our, our group worked similar, you know. Right. A lot of work went into making sure all the paperwork was right for it. But anyhow, so we were awarded $20 million. Uh, but um, the connection there is is that Career Tech, uh, Clarence Fortney, who is our local superintendent, uh, was heavily involved in that. But when the idea was originally uh, brought about, we went to the state, to our local Career Tech board and said, hey, can this be a Career Tech initiative to give us credence? And they agreed to that, so that gave us, you know, credence. We had a little bit of street cred with people saying, okay, are you just a bunch of guys or, and gals trying to raise money? No, we're a Career Tech program, so, uh, and that helped kick us off. So, anyhow, really yeah, exciting. You. Yeah, yeah okay. that's great. Thank you. I did want to tell you some new employees we've had since July 1. Um, I told this to the soups yesterday. The agency, you know, summertime's the time when education agencies lose and gain people. Uh, my daughter called me yesterday and her superintendent at her school, let's see, it's September 20th yesterday, has said, I'm resigning at the end of this semester. So change happens like that in education a lot. But the people of the agency are a little nervous. Uh, you know, in anticipation of a new executive director, we have not filled the chief of staff position because we feel like the new director should have somebody that he or she can work with. And um, so then we've had uh, retirements like any business does, people that have been there for a long time. And then we have people that have found their dream job elsewhere and, and they move on. So people at the agency are a little nervous because is everybody quitting? And no, everybody's not quitting, and new people are coming on. So I'm going to tell you about some new people we have um, uh, to fill in uh, vacancies. And these are people that are starting at an entry level, and, you know, they'll progress through the agency very fast. We're very excited about our hires. We have uh, Samantha Sherman, who's a skill center instructor. But remember, our skill center's employees are agency employees. And then we have Ashley Hall, <coughs> pardon me, Ashley Hall, a fax administrative assistant. And Rhonda Hill, a BMITE program specialist. Rose Deaver, an admin administrative assistant. I like that title. So she's an administrative administrative assistant. She sat down in our area and she uh, replaced a lady named Valerie who went down to the finance part. And uh, this young lady always has a smile on her face every day. And um, one quick story. We've kind of tried to tighten up security at the agency because of what's going on in today's world. And so we've had a few hiccups, uh, making sure people check in and get their visitors' badges, and I won't go into all that. But uh, So she's been here about four weeks, six weeks, and one of our superintendents came in that actually started at the agency 30 years ago. And she goes, can I help you find something? And you need to get your visitors' badge. And <laughs> he told me about it. I said, good, that's exactly what she's supposed to do. <laughs> go get your visitors' badge. <laughs> So uh, it's really good to see them, you know, take the initiative to talk to uh, guests in the agency and such as that. So that's that. I thought it was guests. So what was the person's name? He goes, Rose. I go. And so I complimented her that she was doing what we ask and uh, making sure people that we want everybody to be in the agency that's supposed to be in the agency, but we just need to know who's in the agency in case of fire and worse things. So anyway, uh, Tim Peden is another skills instructor. Brian Richter is a creative services graphic designer, another guy that comes to work with a smile on his face every day. Uh, Greg Neely is a TNI program specialist. Katha Cinnamon is an accreditation and testing administrative assistant. She's probably lonely this week because they're all out doing accreditations. Uh, Aaron Walker is a federal programs administrative assistant. Tessa Lazor is a professional development leadership and professional development coordinator. And Carson Bradshaw is a STEM administrative assistant. So we've got, you know, that's about uh, 10 new people since, uh, since July 1. So we're very excited about that. Lastly, we have episodes on our website on career tech conversations. And in the latest one, we have Laura Morris, who's our uh, health a careers education program manager. She's been there 21 years and she talks about the need for skilled healthcare professionals. So we've been very busy. Um, a lot of it with these ARPA requests and, and going down to the Capitol. And, uh, but I feel like we have a great relationship. 
with a with a lot of uh, legislators, and they're they're singing our praises. So I'm excited about that. Um, when Mr. LePac was here and talking from the state chamber. We're trying to set up a tour of three tech centers, one uh, suburban, one urban, and one kind of rural. Um, Mr. Warmington, who's head of the state chamber, was raised in Michigan. And you know, it kind of dawns on you, if you're not from Oklahoma, you don't know us. You may know a form of career tech training, but you don't know Oklahoma career tech. So we're setting up um, a tour for him uh, in October and November. He's getting back with us the dates. And his wife, who's a member of the Board of Higher Regents, is going to join us, as well as his daughter. He's just found out about Project Lead the Way, and he's very upset his daughter's not already in the program. So um, to me, uh, knowledge is power, and getting people out and seeing what we're doing uh, just educates them of what really goes on behind doors of tech centers and in our programs at K-12 high school. So I'm very excited to have the state chamber president tour our facilities. So I'll take any questions. Uh, any I just have one comment. Okay. Uh, so kudos to you and your team. Uh, I was fortunate enough to get to uh, see you make your presentation uh, and it, uh, made us proud oh, uh, to be on the board and you guys did a great job. So it's well, uh, these things don't happen, you know, just uh, willy-nilly and it's a lot of hard work and so uh, you and your team made us proud I can well, tell thank you, that. you. I appreciate thank you. Thank you. okay uh, oh one other thing I'm going to add uh, we will be calling a lot of tech centers because the governor's office has asked us for uh, some information on where our piece is in the workforce development uh, the programs we have for truck drivers, welders, uh, our nursing programs, general maintenance, and, and other things. We have a list of questions we'll be working with our superintendents to answer. Very excited. Again, the more we tell our story, uh, the more exciting it is and the more people that get excited about, about what we are. So uh, that's the last thing I have to, to tell. So thank you guys so much. And we will move on as soon as I get back to the agenda. Okay, at this time, uh, we'll have a discussion of the minutes. Anyone have a question on the minutes from August 16th? Move for approval. Second. There's been a motion and a second to move for approval. Uh, any questions? Clerk, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Secretary, please call the roll. I revert. That's okay. Mr. Hillary? Yes. Ms. Hernandez? Yes. Mr. Gilbert? Yes. Mr. Dillingham? Yes. Mr. Brown? Yes. Okay, at this time, we'll take a discussion and vote on the minutes from the August 31st meeting. Those minutes were exciting. So moved. There's been a motion? Second. <coughs> moved and seconded to approve the minutes from August 31st, 2022. Secretary, please call the roll. Mr. Brown? Yes. Mr. Dillingham? Yes. Mr. Gilbert? Yes. Ms. Hernandez? Yes. Mr. Hillary? Yes. Thank you. Okay, motion passed. At this time, I'll ask Dr. Justin Walker to come up and tell us about his annual accreditation for this training for the State Board. Well, I do apologize that you have me today versus um, Ms. Ventress. She, as Dr. Denny said, and the accreditation staff are actually at Canadian Valley um, today and tomorrow. They conclude the visit. Um, so accreditation season has started. and. She was unable to be here today to provide this training, but I hopefully I can wing it and get through it for you and not make it too painful for you. Um, the accreditation division, you are recognized by the federal level, the U.S. Department of Ed, as the accrediting body that accredits tech centers in the state of Oklahoma. We as the agency conduct those activities on your behalf. As you know, we bring you reports and make recommendations to you, but we're acting on your on your behalf. Why do we accredit tech centers? I'm not going to read this to you. You can read, but the first thing is we want to assess the quality of their programs and the, the services they provide at the tech centers. The second piece is very important to our accreditation process, and that's the continuous improvement. We expect them to continuously be improving. Even if they're meeting the standard and doing well, we would still like for them to continuously improve. The third bullet um, basically deals with compliance. There are those checkbox items 
that we have to make sure a tech center is doing. Um, discrimination, um, those issues, are they handling things like that correctly? Website um, disclosures, all of those. So we're, we want to make sure they're following the rules both at the state level and the federal level, and that's the compliance piece. The fourth bullet is in order for our tech centers, and all of them but one, offer financial aid. And in order for those students to be eligible to receive financial aid, that tech center has to be approved by a, or accredited by a recognized accreditor. We go through that process with the, with the NSICI, which is the National Advisory Committee on Institutional Quality and Integrity. That group makes a recommendation to the U.S. Secretary of Education on whether we should be an accreditor. And so we go through that process every five years ourselves, much the same as we put the tech centers through. We are going through that process this year. So, and so um, for our students to receive financial aid, we, we must be accredited. Um, the benefits, we, the peer review is probably the number one thing that our, our tech centers can get out of it. Besides us accrediting them, they, the, and we'll talk more about this in a second, the teams are made up of other technology center staff from other technology centers. So it's great professional development and most of our centers, it's not required, most of our centers provide examiners for other schools. So it's, they, they send people and let them spend work days going and helping accredit other tech centers. It's great PD. We had a superintendent last year that after the visit she told me, I need every one of my people to come do this. This is great. And so, um, like I say, they learn the, the practices of other tech centers. Um, like I say, it's just a great, great PD for our tech centers. Talking about the financial aid piece, 28 of our tech centers, as I said, participate um, in the financial aid. Um, this data is from 2021. It's a little dated because they run a year behind the feds do in reporting the data. So hence 2021 data. Um, 2,880 students received Pell Grants for a little over 11 million. 720 received federal grants or work study for 229,000. So it's a financial um, win for our students for us to, to be able to offer the financial aid. There are seven standards that we, we evaluate schools on. The, the top six are what they really work towards in their applications applying for, and seven is judged throughout the application, for lack of a better way to say it. They do write data for seven, but it's there's not a way to target and work on seven. It's the culmination of everything they've done and how they're doing with that data. Um, and obviously, they're pretty straightforward standards. We, since we are accredited by by NASICI, by the feds, we do not, we cannot change this without taking this back to them. So if we bring to you a recommendation that we want you to change this, once you are to approve it, then we'd have to take it to the feds. So we try not to change things willy-nilly once, because it's, it's, it's a process for us to get, to go through with you approving it and then taking it to the feds. So we try to stay pretty consistent with what we do, obviously. The accreditation process, the schools can earn full accreditation, probational accreditation, dropped accreditation, or they can be reinstated. When we do it, and we'll talk, I'll hold off on that. Accreditation is a five year, up to five years, and we review it annually. So annually, staff looks at it. We don't bring it back to you every year but we look at it annually to make certain that they're staying on track and, and performing as they should. For the tech center, this process starts with them receiving training on how to actually write the application. We train them, we tell them this is what we're going to look for. They write the application. They work with accreditation staff to coordinate all the visits. We go through the visit with them. After we produce a feedback report, we give it to them. They have a rebuttal process by policy. So if we say this is not appropriate, they're allowed to rebut it. And we go through that with them. Um, if they have to write a corrective action plan, if they do not meet a standard, 
that corrective action plan um, has to be written within 60 days of, of your approval. Um, after they come to the meeting, like I said, they, <clears throat> thing that confuses a lot of people and it's the point I really want to emphasize when we give them what's called OFIs opportunities for improvements they can meet the standard they will get OFIs regardless of if they met a standard or not we will give them opportunities for improvement and it sometimes causes confusion that they think and board has thought well they need to address every OFI no they will we'll talk about it in a second but they will pick one OFI per standard if they've met standard if they don't meet standard, they are required to correct it within 60 days if they don't meet a standard. Or that's when they would trigger to a probationary if something were to click to that. The examiners, as I say, our examiner teams average between 20 to 30 people depending on the size of the technology center. That's a broad range, but smaller tech centers, obviously less people. Multiple campuses require multiple examiners. All examiners re re do a online training. Um, New examiners participate in additional training. Um, they meet before the visit. We go through the visit. They write strengths and OFIs. They're the ones who write them. Um, I will. We will. Once that team of twenty people have written a report, it goes to agency personnel outside of the accreditation division to edit. We we luckily have a group that used to write curriculum for us. So they are professional writers. So the reports you see have been written by professional writers. They take examiner comments. They don't editorialize. They don't, they strictly, if four examiners have said the same thing at a visit, they will capture that and write it into one strength versus four being duplicated four times. So it, they also, the examiner score, every standard has subsets. They will score that on a rubric of one to five. And um, what we do is then we take their scores, we average them, it's three or better, they've met standard. If it's below three, they did not meet. And so 20 to 30 examiners are scoring them and that decides whether they, they pass or fail. Um, we write the strength and opportunities for improvements. They, the Technology Center, will pick what standard or what OFI within a standard they want to address if they've met standard. Um, we do a three-year monitoring. That three-year monitoring is usually a desktop audit where we will, via Zoom, ask them what have you done on this OFI you said you were going to address and we make them provide um, evidence that they have addressed those OFIs and we address that. Corrective action items, as I said earlier, if they have not met a standard, they're required to immediately write a corrective action, and that's um, 60 days within your approval, or then we've never had anybody not do it. If they didn't, they would trigger them going to probation. So if, if there's a compliance piece, they don't have a discrimination clause on their website, they don't have the right hours in financial aid, they, they're not, something is not right, they, they fix it. Most of, most of the time, it is fixed before we leave the visit. but. Occasionally, they have to have a little more time. As we know, through COVID, we changed and went to a hybrid process. So we do um, visits digitally or virtually. Like the last two days, we've been with Canadian Valley virtually. Today and tomorrow, the teams are on site. And why we do that is if, if the stakeholders that are, are in that community of that, we used to go on site and all the stakeholders would come and we would sit in a room and interview them. We have figured out through COVID that now we can just, we can have a Zoom meeting for all those stakeholders and instead of bringing in 30, 40, 50 stakeholders and wasting their time driving to a tech center, they can sit down on their computer, go through an hour long interview with staff and we can meet the, meet the measure. Uh, as we said earlier, the length of the visit is determined by the size of the tech center, how many campuses. Um, we, as I mentioned, we do virtual interviews first on, on, on site, we do program observations. We'll actually, we'll, the examiners walk into the classrooms and watch the instructor teach. We will interview staff, they interview students, talk to the custodian, anybody in the tech center walking down the hall, an examiner may stop and talk to and ask questions. So we, the, the, my 
very plain spoken English is we crawl all over every inch of it and look at every piece of paper and, if, and just get a good look at what, um, what they're doing. Most of these improvements we've already talked about, you've seen them before. Um, we now assign examiners, it used to be back three or four years ago, if I was an examiner when I went, I looked at all seven standards. Well, we were overwhelming our examiners, and so now we have them look at two standards, and we break them up in teams, and there may be a team of four examiners, and they look at two standards. And there's multiple teams looking at the same standards that are operating independently, so at the end, we get a good cross-section. It's not one group looking at something, so if there's a bias in that group of four people against something, there's another group looking at the same standards independently, so we get a good, a good view of what's going on. Um, We've streamlined the final assessments for examiners. We do require examiners, if they fail a school, not meet, use the proper terminology. If they check a not meet, they have to provide the evidence and tell us why you're saying not met. You can't just say because I don't like this. It has to be what evidence do you have that they're not meeting the standard. And um, we continue to train our technology centers through the process. It's a very short overview of accreditation process that we're required to train you once a year and some of you have been through it I know multiple times but um, others probably less but I will field any questions if you have anything. Um, the only question I have, one thing we learned during COVID is Zoom meetings. They're, you know, they're very, they work very timely. So, so we have 29 districts, they're every five years. So. So there are personal on-site visits to five or six each year, is that correct? It's, it ranges between as low as four, because Kaimishi, for example, is a very large That's district. So we consider it almost like two. I mean, so yes, but you're right. So, so, yes. so, so every site is visited in a five-year period? Yes, yeah. every, okay. every campus, and even if it's not a campus, if it is a Biz site, like some tech centers have a site that may not be considered a campus, but it is a business and industry services site. I won't name school, but but we even visit those sites. So okay. that, that, everybody, very good. Okay. we actually have people that are offended, staff members that are offended if they don't get questioned at a, at a visit because they're so prepped and told to be ready for this visit that when we show up, if if the admin assistant doesn't get questioned by somebody. We usually hear about it. Why didn't the admin assistant get questions? So yes, we're on site everywhere, every five years. Thank you very much. Very good. Other questions? Thank you. Thank Appreciate you, Dr. It. Lockwood. And under management information in your packet, for more items, you have a list. I, I assume you all got this in the mail as well because you're board members of open meeting uh, training. If you are interested at all, it's free to the public, uh, three hours on afternoons, and it's all around the state and then our uh, OEIP which is Oklahoma Education and Industry Partnerships uh, the events uh, for this year are listed in your packet as well so for your information okay at this time we'll move to management action items uh, in your uh, board packet you have a copy of our business plan we'll talk first and then also a copy of our strategic plan uh, for your approval uh, we'll take the business plan first. Uh, any questions you have or any concerns, questions or concerns about the business plan? We got an email about uh, changes, minor changes that were done, but I wasn't able to really get the gist of what those changes were. And well, of course, our uh, appropriations request is a big change in here. Um, and. If you, the top item is a statutory requirement for funding our flex benefit, that is in our base, but we do have to tell the legislature our, our anticipated need for benefit allowance. So that's a change. And then we uh, we have you know increased, just changed our like our graphics and our pictures and, and things like that. Um, our stories at the end. Um, this, we've changed those. So those are the minor changes that we're talking about. Um, on the very first page, page one, is executive summary of what we've talked about. So the numbers change as uh, sites change in uh, schools that we serve and, and tech centers. Adult uh, education and family literacy. That is the old adult basic education. That name has changed. Uh, so it, it's a change on our little star on page one. 
Um, anybody, Lisa, Justin, or Russell, you want to talk to, about any other changes that I may be overlooking? Uh, just basically cosmetic changes. Yeah, cosmetic. Of typos, and obviously the big thing is is the, uh, the budget the request. Appropriations. Yeah, that's the big change. Uh, you'll notice uh, you can turn. Well, I can maybe turn to it. Uh, on page four and five, uh, at the very top is what we at what we received last year, the one hundred thirty-seven point six million, and then uh, we. We worked through the budget request. Um, we did put the agency needs kind of at the top this year. It's been at the bottom and hasn't been funded. And just as I spoke a while back about uh, people uh, leaving the agency and retiring, it has been sort of hard to hire uh, upper level positions such as, I'm just gonna use you as a scapegoat here, Lisa. Lisa needs a finance manager. And uh, our pay bands are such that uh, if you have a choice to go to private industry or come to the agency, they always we have great benefits, but the salaries haven't been raised. And in these inflationary times, it's taken a toll on hiring good people. So um, we want to remain competitive. So we are asking uh, for some increased funds to the agency so that we can uh, increase uh, salaries to our to our employees. We've got great staff and, and we want them to know we appreciate them. And in this world in America, you appreciate them with a pay raise. That's how we show appreciation. Uh, the second big bullet point, education attainment. That's what I talked about, the uh, 160, I round up, 164 programs that have been approved, but they remain unfunded. And we, to these high schools, we give uh, staff support and uh, program support, and that's what that $10.8 million is for. And then, as I said, the technology centers, uh, their ask is $40 million, with $10 million going to uh, respond to their industry needs of training, uh, industry customized training, and workforce programs. But then the $30 million is to expand the offerings at our tech centers. As I said, most of our tech centers, um, well, 90, probably 98% of them have a waiting list. And then uh, the last, we put it last because the legislature loves this part, so we hope they'll read the whole request and get to the last. They love our dropout programs and they love our skill centers. And as we know, last year that's what they funded. Uh, we're hopeful uh, with cash that had been left on the table at, at the Capitol as well as uh, the uh, huge uh, money that was set aside for that ocean project that did not come to fruition for Oklahoma. We're hopeful that we can get some of these things funded. So um, dropout recovery and our skill centers is the last request for 1.25 million. So the total uh, appropriations increase we're asking for is 55.7 million and would raise uh, us from 137.6 million to 193.3 million. And Lisa's here if you have any questions. No, I'm kidding, Lisa. Uh, but do you all have any questions? Uh, you think it's too bold of an ask? Or, or, I mean, if you don't ask, you don't get anything. But uh, what do you all think? I think it looks good. I'm, I'm glad we're going and ask, asking for more because, like you said, if we don't ask, mm -hmm. we don't get it. Yeah. We're, I agree. We've, we've, we've had discussion in, uh, in the in the past about the agency staff, you know, what, whenever the classroom teachers got a raise, which is a very good thing, mm -hmm. uh, and and hope they get another one. But uh, our agency staff, we really struggled, we really struggled at that level to, you know, to maintain or to hire or bring in new exceptional staff. So so that's very good. And of course, of course you know, my passion is K through 12. So the unfunded programs is is. Sure. It's huge to ask for that to be to be brought brought up today to cut the waiting list. Right, absolutely. <clears throat> Anything Very else? Very good, though. I'm like Mr. Trailer. It's you, know, okay. you got to ask. It's bold, but we uh, we feel like it's necessary. Time has come. Move for approval. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve uh, the business plan, including the appropriations request. Uh, Angela, please call the roll. Mr. Hillary? Yes. Ms. Hernandez? Yes. Mr. Gilbert? Yes. Mr. Dillingham? Yes. Mr. Brown? Yes. Thank you. May I uh, point out one pet peeve? 
Yes. Can we Photoshop some safety goggles on these guys? <laughs> <laughs> well, now this is a historical. <laughs> okay. A historical piece, and you're right. Uh, Hopefully, when we put a modern one, since it's in black and white, I hope everybody knows it's historical. And if we put a modern piece, a modern one on, absolutely. They need yeah, safety. I'm a construction guy. you got to be safe, oh, I, safety first. Safety first. Uh, I, I think, I hope we're all safety-minded because, <laughs> gosh, I think my eyes are one of my most precious things on my body. I'd rather do without things than my eyes. Okay, the second is our strategic plan. And again, um, the strategic plan is a rolling document. Um, it's supposed to be like for five or six years, but we have to do it every two years. I mean, this is kind of uh, funny to me, but I'll leave that on the table. So this is a strategic plan. And again, um, a lot of it is it's just been honed in and modified a little bit. but. Um, for instance, under our values, you know, now know we need to be more uh, cognizant of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And uh, so we've added that to our values. Um, other than that, again, we've changed adult basic literacy to adult education and family uh, literacy. And um, we've just kind of cleaned it up a little bit. Russell, do you want to add anything? Uh, not much to add. Uh, you know, we cleaned a few things up, added a few more stories uh, in the strategic plan. Yeah. Essentially it. I mean, of course, one of my favorite, you know, my two favorite stories in the time I've been here is the one of the Tipton FFA student with a pig named Penny, and then our what our Kaimichi paramedic students did. So a detail of what they did is on the last page of this. Um, so uh, those are my two favorite stories since I've been here. And I hope Penny's doing well in Kansas because she gets to, she got to live. So many of them don't get to live after Hawaii, but she got to live. Mm -hmm. Move we approve. Okay. Right. Got a motion and second to approve the strategic plan. Angela, please call the roll. Mr. Brown? Yes. Mr. Dillingham? Yes. Mr. Gilbert? Yes. Ms. Hernandez? Yes. Mr. Hillary? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, at this time we'll have uh, Mr. Glenn Hammonds tell us, talk to us about redistricting and the zoning maps that we had to send several times because the, the uh, uh, file size was so big. Good morning, Director Denny and board members uh, and our viewing audience as well. Today we are, are, are bringing before you an opportunity to approve the rezoning maps for the Technology Center school districts in Oklahoma. This is a process that, uh, as an agency, we began advising and working with the Technology Centers approximately June of 21. Uh, the reason so is e each 10 years after the census data is released to the state, then this, all public entities that have zones or districts uh, go through a process where they try to equalize or as close as possible equalize the, the populations between the zones or districts in their entity. That includes everything from U.S. House districts all the way down to counties and school districts. And this is a process that um, on a priority basis because of the way elections are held um, started with the U.S. House districts in 21. I'll say that in the context of that was one of the priorities because the election's being held every other year. Um, all of us are aware that the census data did not come to the state of Oklahoma or any of the states as early as it normally would after a 10-year census. Normally that information would be received uh, May or June of each year and we would be rolling out the, uh, the, uh, the uh, rezoning in the late summer, early fall. Because of Oklahoma and the states getting the census data as late as uh, late August, early September in 21, then as, as the priorities from a standpoint of uh, rezoning began, the, the local entities had to go through and, and look at their populations and figure out what precinct lines needed to be moved. And so until those were finalized, we couldn't begin the process of doing our school rezoning. 
All that said is we were keeping our, uh, our technology centers apprised as to this process, realizing that we knew that we were going to be uh, having a uh, encouraging deadline of approximately August of 22 for them to have their data presented. And how the, how the technology centers uh, go through the rezoning process is they work with their either the, the uh, Oklahoma House staff, the University of Oklahoma, or their local association of government, and they have mapping software to be able to do this. Now, a long time ago, this was an extremely difficult process, and I'm not saying it's any less difficult now, but we have the technology to be able to do it so much easier. So, why are you being called upon to do this? We have a statute in Title 70, Title 70, 14-108, which states between August 1 and December 31 of the year, following the submission by the U.S. Department of Commerce to the president uh, of the official federal decennial census, the board shall reapportion the territory of the technology center school districts into district zones. And the reason this board is being called upon to do that is you all create the technology center districts. Therefore, you have an approval process to just, it's, it's a, uh, an approval process to make sure that everything is being done properly, okay. All that said, you will not see this like at the K-12 uh, schools. Uh, Mr. Hernandez, you're not gonna get a list of four or 500 school districts to, to approve. We, we as the board create the technology center. We are a school choice, a choice school. And so we are called upon to have, have a different involvement in the redistricting process. All that said, all the technology centers have provided us maps demonstrating that they have, and, and also the data to <laughs> demonstrate that they have met within the requirements of the statute to be able to rezone as close as possible within the standard of what is allowed. All those maps were sent to you. You all had an opportunity to review that 30, 40, 50 page document. And what we advise the technology center districts to do is work with your local, your county election boards, and some of them work with one or two. Some of them may work with 15 or 20. See what their requirements are for you to be able to have elections once this rezoning is done. Because we didn't want to be giving them some advice and then a, a county election board says, well, that's nice, but we need meets and bounds. And for those of you that are in the land process or land uh, process and you understand what meets and bounds, uh, having descriptions of, of uh, a beginning at the northwest corner of this section going eight miles and then a 90 degree angle, if that's what the county election board needed, that's great. They prepared them for whatever their county board, so there was local control. The, all these maps went to the, technology, the respective technology center board districts, uh, school to the boards. They were approved there, and they have been submitted to us. And so now, all that said, we're in front of you today to have those approved by you. The, the idea as to why we were doing this, shooting for the September board meeting, this allows board uh, technology center boards to go back to their local public and say, okay, these maps are now official. And so when we start looking toward the election, school elections that will be held in January with, uh, with uh, filing periods in December, people can look at the maps and tell what zone are they in. And this isn't something that we're pushed up right against at the last minute where people are surprised that they moved from zone three to zone five and they were planning for running for board and they can't or they have to move to be able to do this. So we timely did this in such a way to work with the technology center boards to be able to get this out now, get this to you. You all have the opportunity to approve it. Once it's finalized, they will go back to the county election boards, each technology center board, and then we'll be able to roll those maps out and be ready for the January elections. Helpful? Ms. Hernandez. I yes. have a question yes, for you uh, because I was waiting to get more from you on what it looked like for creating a process of community involvement, public comment, public input as to how these lines, what we're approving today, what that looks like because you're going to send it back to them as approved. They're getting what they're getting without any, you know, input from the community. So, well, actually, Actually, the, the local boards have had community involvement because they have, I believe, I believe almost all of them have taken it to their board on a first reading with proposed maps. Had it on a reading, 
had at a board meeting with no action taken other than just discussion. So they roll it out. And obviously the mapping software tries to stay as close as possible to precinct lines. Uh, in other words, at, at a school board level, it's it's not as likely to for their allegations of gerrymandering or something like that because when you're following precinct lines and, and your your numbers are small enough that you can't deviate that much without it being very obvious and the public has, has an opportunity to see all that. So that said, from public involvement, it's at the board level. Um, local board. Local board level. And when did that happen? That happened... Some, some of it started as early as March and, and April of this year. Some schools try to get way out ahead of this, and, and we told them, you can do it as early as you can get the numbers, but what we will tell you is, is that uh, the House staff, OU staff, and the, the associations of governments uh, have time frames that they're trying to work in counties, they're trying to do in other uh, entities that have zones and boards, and so you're, you're competing on, on their time, so you'll have to, you know, just get in line to be able to do that. Some of them started very early, and some of them finished up in like uh, later this summer. So it's been a process for some schools that uh, had it, you know, maybe in uh, April and May. Some as recently as early September. Okay. But but the, by by doing it at the local board that way and having the first reading and second reading, it, that it gave the people an opportunity to see what was happening. And also, it gave them an opportunity to engage their local boards to say, ah, population has moved, or uh, instances where, like, this board helped uh, Mangum to do an annexation. Well, obviously, their numbers are going to be a little different because you added an entire school district there. And so, because of that, that's going to make the other four zones look a little different than they did 10 years ago. The sad part of this is this is a process that goes on about every 10 years. And it's, it's difficult to remember how we did it 10 years ago, and technology has changed as well. And so uh, that's, that's one of those things that it's caused. It's, this process seems like it's gone on for a year and a half, and it's because it has. Had we gotten those census numbers earlier, we would have done this last year, like about last August or September. But when we don't get them, when the state doesn't get them until uh, August or September, then there's just no way to get those uh, proposed maps earlier to you. And the whole purpose of this is so that people, the public, can have the opportunity to see them, to react to them, and to not be surprised when they're ready to run for election or when it comes time to vote as well. And I know many of us uh, saw our precincts change this, this, last, uh, this last year after, after the rezonings were done um, in our own residences. Now, some, some people may not have, but many did. Were there any notable expressed uh, negative implications to this redistricting? There did not seem to be, and all the schools were very excited to do this. I, I, I say that uh, with a, a, a small grin on my face, uh, realizing it, it's, it's an opportunity for them to engage their constituents, and they took it as that, to be able to do that. So uh, everything was well within the standards as to what was allowed, and at this time, uh, like I said, you all have seen the maps uh, and the information. If it's appropriate, uh, I ask for a motion to approve. And just for clarity, yes, you said that um, the tech centers work with the house and with OU. Are the, those the only two entities? And the uh, some of the associations of governments, like um, the COG. NCOG, okay. INCOG, yeah, up, up in northeastern Oklahoma. And, and it's basically, I mean, we don't make any recommendations from the standpoint, several different people have this software, and they work with their, what well, I call vendor of choice. Uh, some of them have a great comfort level that they've worked with the same people for decades, and so uh, they all have very high quality software to be able to do that. Thank you for the um, it, It's my understanding that, that from the state board level, we are statutorily required to, I'd say, bless what the local boards have done. They have, they have looked. They've done the work. They, they've had the meetings. Uh, so, so, you know, I mean, I think we're statutorily required to to take action on it in one way or another. So, with that, I move we accept the uh, redistricting zone maps. Second. 
and I, I would totally agree from the standpoint that the State Board is required to take action. Had you seen or had staff seen something that was an outlier, right. then we would not be here talking about approving these maps today. We would Absolutely. have gone back to the school and said, well, you know, you've got, you've got one whole school district here that this just doesn't make sense. You've got a zone that's 25% larger than everybody else and it looks like you're trying to water down votes. So the ones that we've seen, the ones that you've seen, are in line with what's allowed under the statute. As an oversight, we're yes, very good. Okay, I have a motion and a second to approve the redistricting zone maps. Uh, Angel, please call the roll. Mr. Hillary? Yes. Ms. Hernandez? Yes. Mr. Gilbert? Yes. Mr. Dillingham? Yes. Mr. Brown? Yes. Thank you. Okay, that motion passed. Uh, Mr. Hammonds, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, one last thing I want to draw your attention to. You have in your uh, packets our, our new hot off the press rules, uh, administrative rules in Oklahoma Administrative Code Title 780 uh, that uh, took effect on September 11, 2022. So these are in effect, and if you have any uh, need for a late night reading, this is the ticket. Okay. Uh, next item, we have a proposed executive session. Uh, can I have a vote to convene? A motion we move into executive session. Okay. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we go into executive session. All in, uh, please, Angel, please call the roll. Mr. Brown? Yes. Mr. Dillingham? Yes. Mr. Gilbert? Yes. Ms. Hernandez? Yes. Mr. Hillary? Yes. Okay. I would ask the Dr. Denny and I be allowed to attend this. Yes. Okay. Let's don't know the minutes. No, Estella, you have to stay. I'm kidding. It will take about five minutes. Thank you, sir. Okay. So, Clarence, I mean, Oh, that'll be it. There's nobody can top that. I read the second one. Well, there you go. Well, that's and then awesome. somebody made a comment. They go, "Well, if you like that one, wait till you hear the next one." I mean, they just kept getting. They were not better and better, but they just were awesome. equal, equal, equal. There was just nothing that could stand out from one to the next. Oh, that's great. good. Okay, it's well, going to be a tough decision. Okay. All right. <clears throat> We'll wait just one moment for our attorney to join us. You can go ahead if you want. <laughs> All right, <clears throat> we'll be um, entertaining a motion to come out of executive session. So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 It's unanimous. And um, it, we'll let the record reflect that I joined executive session um, during that time and uh, no votes were cast or decisions made in that meeting for um, executive session. All right. Uh, is there a motion? Uh, yes, I'd like to make a motion that we invite uh, four candidates from our, our search, numbers 2, 5, 9, and 32, to attend our next meeting in person in October and, and interview for um, the position. Second. Excellent. And that, that will be in executive session that we would be doing those. Okay. All right, so we have a motion. Should we let the records like that meeting will take place in Stewart? Yes, that's very good. The record should reflect that that'll be a uh, Stillwater meeting um, on campus at the Career Tech State uh, Agency. Okay, please call the roll. Mr. Brown? Yes. Mr. Dillingham? Yes. Mr. Gilbert? Yes. Ms. Hernandez? Yes. Mr. Hillary? Yes. Superintendent Hoffmeister? Yes. All right, that motion carries. With that, I'll ask if it uh, looks like there's nothing else um, on the agenda. So with that, we are adjourned. Thank you. Boys.